in memory of the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of the Republic of Ghana and the most renowned Pan-Africanist. We, it is not lost on me that Ghana is celebrating this day in his honor and memory and it is not lost on me that the great Kwame Nkrumah has now been fully rehabilitated in the life of Ghanaians and in the life and minds of Africans. <laughs> A writing about Pan-Africanism, Kenya's renowned scholar Ali Mazurui says, that when one thinks about the unity of Africa and the Pan-African movement, several names come to mind. Names such as South Africa's Nelson Holisasa Mandela and Tanzania's Julius Kambarage Nyerere. But no name is greater than that of Ghana's Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Indeed, we will remember that a few years ago, at the turn of the century, Africans, both in the continent and outside of it, were asked to vote for the greatest African who ever lived. And unanimously, they said that it was Osage for Dr. Kwame Nukuruma. It is therefore right and fitting to be invited to speak in memory of a man such as that. On Monday, we had the occasion in the first series of our lectures to examine the status of politics in Africa, and we agreed unanimously that the problem of Africa is simply and squarely one of leadership. We then asked ourselves what has been the impact of poor leadership in Africa and we determined for ourselves that indeed African economies continue to punch below their weight because our politics is wrong. We agreed with Liberia's Johnson Salif that Africa is poor because she is poorly governed. Today, we pose the question, what it is or what is it that has undermined African unity? And before we begin to talk about contemporary Africa, we must ask ourselves, where did the rain start beating us? We must go deep into history and ask ourselves why this continent and her people have been the most abused throughout human history. As early as the 15th century, this continent was an attraction to other civilizations. Explorers came into this part of the world under the guise of looking for resources, and they did not stop there. They proceeded to invade the land of Africa, and in a manner of speaking, harvested Africans and more than half the population of Africa was taken out of this continent to be enslaved. When the project of slavery lost its shine and luster, another project came into Africa. Africa was parceled out in 1884 in Berlin, Germany, the French took their peace, the Dutch took their peace, the Germans had their share, the Portuguese had their portion, and the British had their share. And Africa has never been the same again. When the colonial project lost its luster, once again, another project was instituted in a much more subtle way, the neo-colonial project. 
And even now, Africa is not at ease. One need only look at Africa as it stands today to understand that our continent is in dire straits. When we move from the southern part of Africa, even in that land of Nelson Mandela, they are not at ease. They may describe themselves as the rainbow nation, but there is a sense in which that country is not completely at ease. The Africans are still reeling from the pain of apartheid. And if one moves into the neighborhood in Namibia, the Namibians are still grappling with the pernicious and pervasive presence of a system of government that treats them as second-class citizens. And when one moves a little farther in the north, in Angola, into Mozambique, they are not at ease. Some of the problems were inherited from the erstwhile colonial masters, but some we have created ourselves. So that today, when we look at Africa, Africa has the infamy of being the home of the most conflicts in the world of different intensities. Elections have come, and after every election in Africa, we enter into an arena of conflict. Right now, in Zambia, after they concluded their elections, they are still quarreling. They are rising e against each other. The Bemba are not at ease with the Chichewa. And in Mozambique, the Shoshangane are not at ease with their neighbors. In Zimbabwe, the country is falling apart, and the Ndebele are not at ease with the Shona. In Central African Republic, the country is not at ease. In South Sudan, the Nwera and the Dinka are not at ease. In the home of the African Union, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the Oromo are rising up, and they say they can no longer be ruled by the Tigrinya, and Africa is not at ease. In Nigeria, the Igbo are not at ease, the Fulani are not at ease, the Yoruba are not at ease. Even in your little Ghana, in little low intensity, the Fante may be at ease with the Akan and the Eve, but the undertones is that our continent is not united. Which begs the question, what must we then do? Is it a new realization? We are gathered here today in honor of a man who could see these things ahead of his time. I had last night the advantage of reading a statement that was made by one who was a member of the delegation, the Ghanaian delegation in 1963, Kofi Batsa. And he writes about Kwame Nkrumah the man who could see tomorrow. And he remembers so very distinctly on the 24th day of May, 1963, when the Osagie for Kwame Nkrumah was given the opportunity to speak to his fellow African leaders in an animated fashion, Kofi Basa remembers, he abandoned his written script and pointed at all the African leaders who are there much more prominently, he remembers, he pointed at Ethiopia's Hail Selassie and told him, you Hail Selassie, we will not be there if we do not unite. And once he had finished with Hail Selassie, he turned over to Nigeria's Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa and he told him, if we do not unite, even you will not be there. And he did not stop there. He turned to Fulba Maga of Dahomey, now the Benin and told them, if you, we do not unite, you will not be there, and I will not be there. And as if you were a prophet, so soon thereafter, they had all been overthrown, including the Osagie for himself. Unity, or is it disunity, is Africa's Achilles heel. Let us understand the Africa that we are talking about. It is an Africa that today is divided into 54 odd countries. 
It is an Africa that has over 3,000 ethnicities and over 2,000 languages. It is an Africa that, as I've said, was parceled out in Berlin. It is an Africa which Europeans still refer to strangely in the following terms and is the only continent that is referred to as such. That Africa is sometimes described as Anglophone Africa to suggest that there is a part of Africa which speaks English even when only 1% of the population speaks English, we are referred to as Anglophone. And Ghana is therefore Anglophone. Kenya is Anglophone. And they don't stop there. They go to the former French colonies and they look at a few leaders speaking French and they say that is Francophone. And we who have the advantage of going to school also proudly refer to ourselves as Anglophones and Francophones. And they do not stop there. They go to the former Portuguese colonies and they say these are also Lusophones. No other continent in the world is referred to in those terms. The consequence is that the continent continues to be divided. Today, when one looks at Africa and her 54 unviable nations, with her 54 national anthems, with her slightly over 40 useless currencies, <laughs> with her many passports, the currencies are not useless because they do not work. They are useless because they only have meaning within the boundaries of their countries. So that your city beyond Ghana has no value in Togo. And the Togolese with their franc beyond Togo, it has no value in Benin. And their currency in Benin beyond Benin, it has no value in Gabon. But yet, when you are confronted with the almighty dollar and the almighty euro, you quake in your boots. <laughs> Africa is disunited. And this disunity is because we do not know that we are weak because we are disunited. We know in unity we can find a solution. And this was so very evident as early as 1963. The clarion call for unity was evident in many parts of the world. In the eastern part of Africa, Tanzania's Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere, when asked by the British to lead Tanzania or then Tanganyika to independence, said, I want to delay the independence of Tanganyika that Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania may become independent as one nation. The other leaders refused. They had been given the dose that makes Africans think in a manner that is confusing and at once schizophrenic. They were told that you must retain this intangible thing called sovereignty. And they accepted. And the East African region has been grappling with unity. In this part of the world, after Ghana had attained our independence, there was no shortage of effort on the part of the Osage for Kwame Nukuruma to entice other leaders into some form of unity. And you Ghanaians will remember that he signed a treaty with Congo's Patrice Emery Lumumba and Mali's Modibo Keita to create the first semblance of a united Africa. But even in those early days, the French were not resting. They were using other leaders such as Felix Oufebwanyi to create a different Francophone arrangement meeting in Antananarivo in Madagascar, then known as Malagasy. Divide and rule has been the method that has been used against us. So the question that we must ask today Will this continent continue to be in political and economic diapers until the second coming of Christ? <laughs> Will this continent continue to punch below our economic and political weight? 
to be treated as a junior at every assembly of the Committee of Nations. With this continent only continue to participate in international fora as a junior partner? Will this continent only continue to relate with other civilizations in the world in the manner that a horse relates with the rider, with Africa being the horse and the rider being other civilizations? This is a question that we must pose to ourselves. Osage for Kwame Nukuruma had no clouds in his eyes. He had no doubt in his mind that the only antidote to the malady of disunity was unity itself. And he was so eloquent not only in 1963, no sooner had Ghana attained her independence than in 1958, on the 30th day of April, he assembled a group of African leaders, the then eight independent countries at that time, and told them, we must find a common denominator, and that common denominator is that we must unite. And he did not stop there. In 1961, he visited Casablanca, Morocco, and talked to the people of Africa, then telling them that we must unite. In other words, his clarity was that Africa could only achieve her potential in the arena of unity. But he was not under any illusion. He was not simplistic about it. He was not saying that we dissolve all our cultures. He knew that we could attain unity in diversity. And Ali Mazurui, in fact, captures it in a manner that it has, is at once titillating and instructive. He says that if many of you thought that Africa was a tower of Babel, there is power in the tower of Babel. And he says, look at Africa today. If you are to combine the beauty and the energy of the Igbo of Nigeria, give it a dash of the quest of excellence of the Yoruba of Nigeria, the color and the class of the Asante of, Na of Ghana, the beauty of the Fante peoples of Ghana, and you are to combine it with the energy of the Bangala in Congo and the Ovambo and the Vumbundu in Angola and the quest for perfection of the Luo in Kenya and the energy of the Kikuyu in that country and the regal nature of the Baganda in Uganda. What would that be? A recipe for something that the world would envy until the second coming. But what have we chosen to do? We have chosen to use our diversity not as a cultural mosaic which can create energy and synergy for our benefit, but we have allowed it to be used for purposes of dividing us. That is why in Burundi, they can be persuaded that because the Tutsi have longer noses, the other ones with flatter noses are the Hutus, and they are told to fight until kingdom come. It can be done differently, and it must be done differently. Today, when I want to travel to many African countries, Ghana excluded because you now accommodate everybody, and it's fitting that Ghana should have led this process. If you want to travel to many African countries, you are confronted with the immigration, complete with yellow fever certificates. Soon they are going to ask us to have Ebola free certificates. And all manner of maladies. Movement in Africa is difficult. If you want to move to Liberia from here, notwithstanding that we are within the ECOWAS, you'll meet many immigration officers and many papers you'll have to fill. If you are traveling to Angola, it's easier to travel to Europe than to travel to Angola or even to the Gambia. 
Africa is as divided as it was at the beginning of the struggle for independence, despite the fact the organization of African unity was created to unify us, and despite the fact that we changed our name in the year 2002 to African Union, despite the fact that we have many African institutions, despite the fact that we have ECOWAS and SADC and the Sahelian and other regional organizations, we are in a state of disunity. The question is, can we solve the problem? The answer is, we must solve the problem. And the decision to solve the problem rests with us. And you know, when I take time, and I took time, to look at the 32 speeches that were delivered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, on the 24th and 25th days of May 1963. There were 32 leaders speaking at that time. And I look at the speeches that were made in the year 2013. There is a sense in which when you listen to the leaders of 1963, they were in a class of their own. What they could see sleeping, our leaders today cannot see when they are wide awake. <laughs> there is a sense in which they had a sense of passion of unparalleled kind. And many of them did not have the advantage of the resources that the current leaders have. When I look at, for example, Zambia's Kenneth David Kaunda talking about Africa, talking about his own country, one country and one nation, and that nation, Zambia, and that nation must be an example for Africa, you get to realize that these were selfless individuals and he was speaking for Central African region because he recognized that it's only through unity that Africa could be delivered. And indeed, many of you will remember that African unity at that time, on the different occasions that Africans have decided to unite, Africa has always delivered. When Ian Smith declared Rhodesia to be independent from South Africa, from the British, the Africans organized themselves at that time. And you remember the frontline movement involving Zambia's Kaunda. You remember Tanzania's Kambarage Nyerere, how they sacrificed to ensure that Zimbabwe was free. And they were bombed by the South Africans at that time, but they were united. You remember until 1975, Mozambique, was a colony and you'll remember that Angola was a colony but the Africans united and they spoke with one voice and because they spoke with one voice those countries were delivered from the yoke of Portuguese colonization but no sooner had they been delivered than a feat of amnesia set in they forgot that they were Africans and they were gravitating towards Lisbon. That is the tragedy of Africa, that when the chips are down, the educated African particularly respond to the erstwhile colonized. Typically, Africans who are educated, and I've said this before and I repeat it, those of us who are, whose countries were colonized by the British, your greatest pride and your greatest ambition is when you have a flat in England. And when you are talking about your flat in England, your chest is pushed out as if to celebrate that reality. Your greatest love is when your child visits or attends a British education system. That is your greatest joy. In other words, our minds were long captured. I said that because of our disunity, when you speak to the French, former French colonies, when you talk about unity, and I remember one day, the president of Senegal 
was a way out of his country and there was a problem in his uh, country in Dhaka, Senegal. They did not have water for one week and he appealed to dear France to come and fix the water. They did not appeal to Ghana or Nigeria. No, it must be France. It must be Paris. And the Portuguese, in their default mode, they'll not appeal to South Africa. What they'll do is to appeal to Lisbon. That is how we have been tutored and is a byproduct of our disunity. Kwame Nkrumah was able to see this. And I want us to examine what he said in 1963. He said, among other things, if we do not come out of this, con uh, this conference a united front, then I can assure you that we will be recolonized again. And this time round, the recolonization, which will be of a much more subtle and a much more pernicious kind. Many of you may think that the neo-colonial project is dead and as dead as Dodo. I want to remind you that the neo-colonial project is alive and well. The only difference now is that the players are different. You know, as I talk about African unity, China refuses to get out of my mind. And I hope I'm wrong. But the Chinese know that we are disunited. And they know that in our disunited state, we can be manipulated. And they are in the process of manipulating us. So today, there is not a single African country in which the Chinese have not built a stadium. They think we love stadia. <laughs> there is not a single African country in which they are not building some roads. The Chinese are capable of delivering three types of qualities of the things they do. Quality number one, they take to the United States of America and Europe. Quality number two, they take to their fellow Asian countries, including India. Quality number three, which is at the very bottom, they dump in Africa, and the Africans consume them gleefully. <laughs> and it's because of our disunity we are incapable of speaking with one voice. You know, many times when I look at Ghana, the Ghanaian president whom I respect is invited to Beijing to negotiate with Beijing as indeed the Kenyan president would be and the Burundi president to negotiate with Beijing on a bilateral basis. And when they invite African leaders, they humor them, complete with guards of honor and 21 gun salutes. So that they think that they are equal. But the Ghanaian economy's GDP is possibly one third of the GDP of the city of Beijing. The Burundian economy is only two billion United States dollars which is the same amount that an American professional boxer earns in one year. <laughs> the economy of Benin is smaller than Coca-Cola's advertising budget for one year. <laughs> in other words, African economies are Mickey Mouse economies which cannot compete. And because we are disunited, we are incapable of moving as one unit. The European Union wants to have what they call bilateral negotiations with Benin. The European Union's combined economy, perhaps the largest market in the world today, is something in the neighborhood of 14 trillion United States dollars if you combine the European Union economy and you have bilateral negotiations with Benin. That is smaller than the turnover of Standard Chartered Bank. 
In other words, the president of Standard Chartered Bank could very well be the one negotiating with the president of Benin if we were to be realistic. But that is because we are disunited. And I'm submitting to us that the only antidote to that is our unity. I know, as I said yesterday, that there are already efforts to move Africa in the direction of unity at the economic front, but the suspicions in Africa are too great. The African politician is perhaps, with due respect to them, Africa's curse. The day the African politician realizes that the occupation of political office and political space is one of servant leadership, that is the day Africa will begin to move in the right direction. The day the African politician realizes that the occupation of public space and public office is an honor and a privilege, that is the day Africa begins to move in the right direction. The day the African politician recognizes that the occupation of office is not one for the privatization of public wealth, that is the day Africa will begin to move in the right direction. The day the African politician recognizes that they do not have the monopoly of wisdom, that is the day that Africa will begin to move in the right direction. The day the African politician realizes that longevity in office is not the solution to African problem. That is the day Africa begins to realize the potential. The day that the African politician begins to remember that the electoral vote is a charge for them to deliver on health, on agriculture and education, that is the day Africa will begin to know her place in the world. The day the African politician is liberated from the chains of greed, that is the day that Africa will realize the potential. And I say all that because it is not lost on me that one of the reasons why Africa cannot unite is because we have become so used as politicians in Africa to our little countries where we are treated like demigods. And because we too, we who are the led, we have treated our leaders as demigods for too long and they now are conditioned to believe that they are gods. You know, respecting leaders is a good thing because that is what is right. Once you have given people the privilege to serve you, you give them respect. But respect must be earned. Many times in my own country, in Kenya, I see the individuals, some of the individuals that we elect into public office, some are fine, but some are not. In fact, most are not. And in my rural village, they elect some semi-illiterate individual who everybody knows is semi-illiterate and everybody knows he is not wise. <laughs> but the day after his election, when he attends a forum such as this, those who invite him to speak will say, let so-and-so whom we elected yesterday share his wisdom with us. And I want to assure you that there is no magic in the ballot box. If you are a dunderhead, the mere fact that you have been elected does not convert you into anything. You just remain an elected dunderhead. And Africa has no shortage of dunderheads who are leading her in the wrong direction. The direction of disunity. 